Uh, Poe Bronson is the author of five books, including the New York Times bestseller, What Should I Do With My Life? And he has a piece in uh, the first issue of Canteen, which is for sale. Uh, <laughs> I'll go, anyway, uh, because he's writing about the issue of reader suicide, we're giving him eight minutes instead of five. Bo Bronson. So when Sean published this, um, for legal reasons, we had to change these people's names, but I think you guys deserve their real names. This is called Knowing Your Audience. <coughs> Back in 2003, a man in Iowa tried to kill himself after reading my recently published book. But his reasons for taking his life were lame, so his attempt to knock himself off was even more lame. No blades, no cars over a cliff. He survived. In fact, it was so lame that I feel bad for using his suicide attempt as a cheap hook to lead this very essay. <laughs> Nevertheless, you probably still want to know why he did it. Yeah. and why my book drove him to it, <laughs> and how I feel about that. <laughs> His name was 33 years old, father of two young girls. Three months earlier, his wife asked him for a divorce. He then discovered she was having an affair. She justified it to him this way. He was emotionally withdrawn, a shadow of the man she'd married. By his own admission, this was true. He had recently passed the Iowa bar on the verge of becoming a lawyer, just like his father and brother. He was filled with dread and regret. He was humiliated that something so petty was pushing him into depression. By February 2003, we were separated. I bought him his, my book, hoping it might jolt him from his fog. He read it in three days. Instead of being uplifted by the stories, he was crushed by the realization that he did not have the strength to even leave the house, much less grab life by the balls. The night of February 3rd, he picked up the girls from his house. He set out a bottle of pills and several fifths of hard alcohol. His plan was to drink so much that he could swallow the pills, but he couldn't even do this right. He drank until he blacked out. He got the pill bottle open, but he didn't get much of its contents into his stomach. It was a classic cry for help. Four days later, he wrote me an email and told me a story. By then, I already had an intense fear of my inbox. I would received about a thousand emails from readers. The immediacy of their reaction was rewarding, but their intensity was overwhelming. They weren't just reading the book and talking about it. The book was propelling them to rearrange their lives. For me, that was weird. Books are richest when they live in their own parallel universe, the world of the mind. When a book breaks the fourth wall and actually triggers change in a reader's life, is that a testament to its power? Or does that destroy the richness of that parallel universe? This letter began like any other. Unlike the way I've told this story to you, he buried the headline. Pages went by before he got to the dramatic action that made his letter more memorable than the rest. As I read of his suicide attempt, I was aware that if he was writing this to me, he was clearly still alive. But I was hooked. Sure, I wanted to know what happened to him. But I really wanted to know, did he hate me? Blame me? He woke up the morning after a suicide attempt to the sound of the telephone and was worried about him. He did not find it cathartic or joyous to wake up alive. More like, crap, I'm still here. He told what he'd done, hoping she'd rush over, bring the girls, and reunite. But she would not be manipulated. Instead, she called his brother, who called his father, the lawyer. The lawyer and I had a long conversation about why it had come to this. Yes, the divorce, of course, but was that really it? Finally, he brought up his career, shamefully. The lawyer said what any father would. would. Son, you need to do what will make you happy, and I'll help you, whatever it is. He admitted to the lawyer he wanted to open a restaurant. The lawyer was more than supportive. Just four days removed from attempting the suicide, he was now happy. He could see his life again, and it would be his. Soup and sandwiches. He was writing not to burden me or to criticize my book, but to thank me. End of letter. Holy cow. 
All of a sudden, I became a critic of the story he had written, putting it back in the parallel universe where how well the subject is told, not the subject's survival, is most important. As a reader, I felt cheated. Writers distrust happy endings because they never seem earned. In the writer's rule book, the sentences must end, but any presumption that the story itself wraps up rings false. He slapped his happy ending on like a poorly crafted Hollywood blockbuster. Opening a restaurant is no easy thing. Was I supposed to pretend he wasn't likely to lose all his money and a chunk of his dad's? Was his wife still screwing some other guy? Did she love him? The funny thing was, his wife started writing me later that very week. I knew it was by her name, where she lived, and the ages of her girls, but she never identified herself as connected to she didn't say, I'm the ex-wife of a guy who tried to kill himself after reading your book. She clearly didn't know I already had the scoop on her. Her letters were entirely about her own issues. She was 27, admitted to going through a divorce, but made a plea for sympathy by admitting that she was the one leaving him. Instead, she told me a long story about how she once ran for the school board and wanted to do it again. By accident, an intriguing literary experiment spontaneously occurred unreliable narrator changed my perception of his unlikable narrator. In his own letters, he was too straight to be likable. But in his wife's letters, her dishonest omissions made him likable. For the first time, I was sort of rooting for him. Amateur stories live and die on the premise of reality. They can get away with being bad storytellers. We writers use the techniques of literary style for two reasons. First, we do it to make our stories sing, to make them unfold just so. Second, we use literary style as code to signal other writers, I'm in the club. I'm inside that parallel universe. We need this club because we imagine that the readers in Bumblefuck, Iowa, don't care about books nearly as much as we writers do. But what if that's not true? What if Bumblefuck, Iowa is Des Moines, Iowa? And what if our readers are like, what if they're educated but imperfect and can't communicate all that well with each other and are lonely despite being married and surrounded by family? What if it leads them to take books more seriously than most writers do? What if they react to books more strongly than they react to each other? If so, that calls into question the necessity of the literary techniques we employ. I'm worried we bend our stories to fit the code in such a way that our stories no longer reflect what life is like outside that parallel universe. That's where this essay was going to end. But when I wrote it, when I got this far, several unpolished drafts ago, I became curious about what actually happened to since February of 2003. So I Googled them. <laughs> and I'm relieved to say the story didn't end. First, he actually did open his restaurant with the help of the lawyer and his stepbrother. Oh, I, I didn't foreshadow about the stepbrothers. <laughs> they opened a brew pub, which has been written up several times in the local newspaper. The place is busy every night. He is happy. His chicken wrap is a favorite of the local patrons. <laughs> Married her lover at the end of 2003. He was almost twice her age, but he was passionate about gardening, sailing, and anything outdoors. He owned a cabin in the woods. He and he were going to spend their first summer there, but he didn't make it. He died of heart failure in April 04, mere months after their marriage. The girls took it hard. I even root for now. Knowing your audience gets a bad rap from writers. Car salesmen know their audience. Political pollsters know their audience. I like to suggest that we consider opening the door to knowing our audience. Not so we can please them, but to be re-inspired by them. We are all looking for some faith in the power of the written word. Maybe we should stop listening to each other inside that parallel universe and listen to them, those people out there. We might just find that they're strange and wondrous creatures. Thank you. Wow.